I have to acknowledge our scripture reading is actually two lectionary readings that I've combined. So often they're read separately. I, I think it's uh, quite insightful for us to look at them together. Reading from Matthew 16. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. Skipping ahead a couple verses. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? Let us pray. Lord, get, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and, and think through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire with a love for you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, before jumping into our text today, I would like to kind of establish a broader framework by which we might enter into it. It, it should be of, of no surprise to any of you that Church attendance is down throughout the country, across all denominations, and to find some assumptions even among non-denominational evangelicals. I mean, studies have been done to try to understand why many are not returning to church, particularly amongst the younger generation. According to the Public Religion Research Institute, among the top four leading reasons for leaving previous religious affiliation, we have in, in reverse order, scandals involving church leaders. The family was never that religious growing up to begin with. Negative religious teachings about the treatment of LGBTQ people. And you know what the leading reason was for people leaving their previous religious affiliation? It was simply that they stopped believing in the religious teachings. And when I read that, part of me would, would love to be able to drill down further and ask, well, specifically what religious teachings you stop believing in. I mean, I suspect I might be sympathetic to some of those reasons. Alas, it turns out that many people who have stopped attending church still consider themselves to be Christian, but are wary of identifying themselves with organized 
religion. So in terms of expanding your vocabulary, uh, there, there's a word that's being widely used in certain circles that I think you should become familiar with. And the word is deconstruction. Deconstruction. Sometimes considered to be a way of, of navigating perhaps a faith crisis. It's essentially a way of breaking apart your faith into maybe component parts and wrestling with what it is that you consider worth holding on to and what you now consider to be an even silly or harmful aspect of your faith tradition. And this process, I know, will sound dangerous to some of you, but I'd like to suggest that it can be seen in a hopeful light. There are people out there who have not flat out rejected Jesus, but are, are questioning the lens through which the church often sees Jesus. It is also hopeful because as people are seriously wrestling with these questions, a, a movement that some have called evolving faith has developed that accepts and loves people through this whole deconstruction process. You know, th this is an arena that fascinates me and where I feel called to love and to support people who are going through a deconstruction process. And while some of you might find this notion to be troubling, I would like to suggest that this process can be important and maybe even biblical. In fact, I would like to suggest that our scripture reading today is an example of a form of deconstruction. So let, let's take a look at this text again with that backdrop that I've just offered you. The first section of our reading today tells the story of Peter's important confession of faith. Caesarea Philippi is, is known for having statues of various gods in the marketplace, and it was in this context then that Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And after his disciples offer a few possibilities, Jesus follows up with the important question, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus adds his own commentary to this when he says, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Kind of as a sidebar, I don't know how many of you have read the uh, cover article that I wrote for the recent newsletter. And though it's not language that we are used to, I suggested that we dare not lose hold of the, the, the mystical aspect of our faith. Because I believe that's what Jesus was referring to, her, referring to here when he said that flesh and blood has not revealed this to Peter. He had discovered an, an entry point to faith that transcended the flesh and blood recitation of doctrinal systems. And Jesus underscores the importance of this moment by saying, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Impressive. Give you some pretty amazing credentials for your resume. But the story shifts just a few verses later when we read, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and, and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. I mean, this, of course, was not only what Jesus needed to do to prepare the disciples for what was about to happen to him, but also underscore what this path of discipleship was all about. 
Okay, so you remember Peter, the rock, the rock on whom the church will build, the one who impressed Jesus with his spiritual insights. Well, almost without skipping a beat, it seems as though the rock has turned into a stumbling block. So with his newfound confidence, Peter now rebukes Jesus, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. I mean, nothing could be more contrary to the hope and expectation of Israel than for its long-awaited leader to go directly to the place where it would be in dangerous and there be tortured and killed. In, in his letter to the church at Corinth, Paul writes, Christ crucified is a stumbling block to Jews, like Peter, and foolishness to the Gentiles. I mean, I think we can get that. That almost makes sense. But as if Peter's rebuke wasn't strong enough, Jesus now blasts Peter with, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. We need to understand Jesus passion here, for as seemingly logical as Peter's reaction was, it was completely antithetical to Jesus' core orientation, which is exactly why Jesus needed to go on to say, for if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, for whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? So kind of reframing this gospel account that we just reviewed, I, I firmly believe that what we have just witnessed was Jesus deconstructing the disciples' messianic expectation. Jesus was deconstructing their expectation. You, you see, deconstruction does not need to be bad. It is any process where the core gospel is separated from the ways in which it's been acculturated. And, and this call is just as vital today as it was when Jesus confronted Peter. Obviously, I had all this on my mind this past week when I saw a car on Tuesday with a, a number of Christian stickers on it. And what really jumped out to me was the sticker that read, Be the lion, not the sheep. I mean, what a, what a relevant illustration for today. Even today, Particularly today, there are those who prefer a muscular, steel-fisted Jesus and would have no stomach for the Jesus proclaims, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself. Just like in, in Jesus' time, there are days today who feel called to proclaim a Christianity of cultural dominance as opposed to walking in the way of Jesus who identifies with the marginalized and the abused. This discussion is so relevant. Jesus was a revolutionary leader trying to prepare a, a colonized people for the death of their Messiah. And many churches don't have the stomach for such a message today, so I'm, I'm sympathetic to young people who can smell this tension in the air when a particular church insists on aligning itself with power at any cost to get the job done. We, we need to hear the voice of Jesus say, get behind me, Satan. This, this past July, Joe Terrell wrote an article 
entitled Five Reasons Why Young People Are Deconstructing Christianity. I mean, we clearly don't have time to go through this whole article, but I'll, I'll highlight the five points. Number one, trust in large institutions is declining all across the board. Year 11 writes in a New York Times article, we lose faith in an institution when we no longer believe that it plays this ethical or formative role of teaching the people within it to be trustworthy. The church, to a large extent, has not positioned itself as a redemptive counterculture that holds itself accountable. Number two, we live in a more diverse, accessible, and mobile world. In The Benefit of the Doubt, written by theologian Gregory Boyle, he writes, it's much easier to remain certain of your beliefs when you are not in personal contact with people who believe differently. But when you encounter people with different beliefs, and when those people's sincerity and devotion possibly puts yours to shame, things become quite a different matter. Number three, high-performing Christians are simply burning out. I'm going to skip over. I think that's clear enough. Number four, the prideful prioritization of conformity over unity. Bunny Kirschen, in her book, A Flexible Faith, might be worth reading as an adult ed series. We can get so stuck in our own little pool that we never notice that the stream of orthodoxy is wide and deep and beautiful. And without even realizing it, we can become convinced our own tradition of Christianity is the one Christian alternative to non-belief. Number five, the acceptance of political idolatry and conspiracy theories in Christian communities. It's not a coincidence that deconstruction became more mainstream during, during one of the more tumultuous political eras of modern history. In a book entitled, Where Goodness Still Grows, former missionary Amy Peter Peterson writes, people of my generation aren't leaving the church because their devious atheist professors got to them, but because they saw a church more interested in defending political power than in loving their neighbors. Young Christians want to tackle issues of social justice as a lived out expression of their faith, not in opposition to it. No one wants to serve an organization that exists only to serve itself. Yet personally, I've had many people that I've related to that have been in the process of deconstructing their faith. Have you? If the answer is no, that's probably because people who are in this process are not likely to be hanging out in church. Why? Because they have learned that most churches don't welcome their questions. Well, I could get going on this. There's so much more that could be said. But let, let me leave you just with three, three bullet points, highlights to take home. One, deconstruction does not need to be scary. In fact, it may be a healthy and important part of any vital church of the future. Does your gospel need deconstructing? Two, Pine Shores Presbyterian Church, I believe, needs to foster a church culture where questions are welcome and are not readily followed up with, and here's the answer, and three, finally, we, we need to have confidence in Christ Church. Christ Church. 
even if it ends up looking somewhat different than what we had imagined. In that spirit, I'm going to share a quote from Thomas Merton that I love that I shared at the last session meeting. The fact remains that our task is to seek and find Christ in the world as it is, and not as it might be. The fact that the world is other than it might be does not alter the truth that Christ is present in it and that his plan has neither been frustrated nor changed. Amen.